everybody. Welcome to The Setting Trick. Uh, I'm your guest host, uh, Greg Hinsey. Uh, our normal host, with the most, will not be available today as a host. So without further ado, let me introduce our special guest star today, uh, creator of The Setting Trick podcast, producer of the new movie Double Dummy, and newly crowned NABC champion, my friend, John McAllister. Hi, John. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Shit, I think I cut you off there at the end. <laughs> so, how do you feel being on the other side? Are you nervous? I am, I'm definitely nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And I definitely, like, probably 20 minutes before I got home, I was out. And I was definitely like, okay, this is a... I get nervous before I host the show, but uh, to be... This is a real honor to have you do this. Uh, do you have you do this for me? I feel a great honor for you having me uh, do this. Uh, so uh, I, I'm nervous too. Ah. Though, so. <laughs> so we just dive yeah. right in. Or, yeah, uh, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Because, like, where are you from? Where did you grow up? And uh, okay, how how did you? I'm gonna uh, start. I'm gonna go back. To where you are now. Just a brief so movie. in Phoenix, the, the way this conversation came to pass is in Phoenix after we won the Mitchell Borda match, my first NABC victory. You, Greg, offered to to flip the script here on the setting trick and to interview me. And so that's how this conversation came to pass. And when I texted you about it, you were like, I wasn't sure if you were totally committed to it, but you sent me a list of questions and you, and you, you, know, you had your intro planned. So I really appreciate that. I, I'm, it says a lot about you. And just to go from there, I grew up and I still live in Charlottesville, Virginia. I went to college at the University of Virginia, which is here. My mom is originally from Charlottesville. And it's a great place to live. I've thought about living elsewhere, but haven't really found a compelling reason to uh, to move just yet. I get a lot of travel playing bridge, so I, I get to vi see the world through bridge tournaments, which is, I think is, a, as you probably would attest, a great way to, to see the world. Yeah, I haven't seen much of the world myself, uh, mainly just America, I've seen. <laughs> but uh, so well, what you mentioned you went to college there uh, as well. What, what did you study? study when you? I like to joke when people ask me what I studied in college that I was in a fraternity. <laughs> because <laughs> I really, I was a good student in like I went to a very academically rigorous high school, a boarding school, all, all male boarding school about an hour from here called Woodbury Forest. And the, the teachers there really challenged me to work hard, to learn the material. And then by the time I got to UVA, I sort of crapped out on school. I was technically a history major. I tried to get into the undergraduate commerce school and my I, they didn't accept me. And... Yeah, so I was technically a history major, yeah. but I had worse grades in history than I did in other subjects. It was sort of a last minute thing. My one of my best friends' dad was a history professor, and so he could be my advisor. And it was sort of the easy, easy thing to do when it was time to declare a major at the end of my second year. And so out of school, you went. I had read you were on, uh, involved in the hedge fund company or something. Yeah, you, you did that for uh, yeah. So. There's this guy named Jaffrey Woodruff, who is a hedge fund manager here in Charlottesville. And my parents my, were actually friends with Jaffrey's parents when, when we were younger. And so I got interested in trading because I played a lot of backgammon after I graduated from UVA. My roommate and I in New York City would play backgammon all the time, and we played for pretty decent stakes. And so through backgammon, I heard a, a, I heard a recording where somebody was talking about trading and that really appealed to me from like the same sort of thinking logic as backgammon. And so I got a, the reason I brought up Jaffrey's name is because three different people, my mother, my piano teacher, and then a woman that my piano teacher had set me up with all suggested, they knew I was interested in trading that I should reach out to this guy, Jaffrey Woodruff. And I didn't do it. I never reached out to any of those, through any of those people suggesting it. Only when he, his company appeared on the UVA uh, job site looking for interns did I actually reach out. And then I had a seven and a half year career 
working there, which ended in, in, in 2012. And uh, I just got, I just was tired of working for uh, doing that. At that time, had you uh, played bridge yet? Yeah. So I played, I started playing bridge when I was 18. My parents knew how to play and my aunt suggested it. And I loved it immediately, but I didn't really have an outlet for it. Like in New York City, for example, I lived after I graduated UVA. I lived probably two blocks from honors and it never even occurred to me to seek out a bridge game in, in, uh, in the city. You didn't know it existed, but it, you were right. You yeah, were right. yeah. There was a backgammon club that I never went to, but I was I wanted to try to go there to play backgammon for money against other players, and I never got the courage up to do it. But it didn't even occur to me to think like I, I loved bridge. Like it, it was something I did with my parents when I came home, and it didn't like I played spades with co with friends in college, but I didn't actually occur to to explain bridge to them. How, how did you find the bridge club or whatever to get into the ACBL? So my older sister had three friends that were looking for a fourth for bridge classes when I moved back to Charlottesville and she knew I loved it and she suggested it. And then that woman took me to the, uh, to the local bridge club for the first time. And have you, uh, Thought about making a movie at this point? Oh, yet, no, or no, no, podcast no, 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 or no, This no, no, was no, no, probably, okay. so this, is... this was in like 2000 and... So you learned you learn from your, your, your sister, you said? So my oh, sister yeah. would be our fourth. So my parents kind of knew how to play and my sister would be our fourth, but she wasn't, she never really got into it. She was just willing, a willing participant. And then she had friends that were looking for a fourth for a, like a weekly bridge class. Well, that's good. And uh, what did you start reading about bridge? Like, uh, do you read books? Did you play online? So we had a bridge for dummies book that I bought. And we would, when I play with my parents, we would sort of have that out. They had like a two page cheat sheet maybe. And I had bridge books uh, that I would read. Yeah. I don't exactly remember what, what my first bridge books were or how it all, but I mean, I like I like consuming information about bridge. Like that is one of the things that I love playing bridge. Like to this day, I love playing bridge. I love consuming information about bridge and reading bridge books is a big part of that. What's your favorite uh, couple of bridge uh, books? Well, that's a good question. I'm reading right now Bridge with Another Perfect Partner, which I think was the IBPA book of the year. And so that's by John Carruthers, who I don't actually know. I don't think I know him. I, I don't know if he plays tournaments or not. He's Canadian. And it's like a at the table book where, you know, they give you the deal. And he's got this partner who is a real, like a real expert. And so that guy explains the, uh, how the deal should be played or how he did play it or how he created an illusion to, you know, to beat the contract. It's not something that you can read. Like I'll read, you know, a couple of deals at a time and then like do something else. Cause it's bridge books are not like rare is the bridge book. Uh, um, what's the name of that book? Uh, with the unlucky expert. Oh, uh, the, the menage a trois. Oh, why you lose a bridge. <laughs> oh, why you lose, lose a bridge. Oh, That's probably expert. the, that is a rare bridge book and that you can read it. Like I can read that book all the way through without. I've always enjoyed like uh, the bridge and the menagerie series. Uh, and they had the carapat. I think he was the unlucky expert or whatever. Uh, he was labeled as such, but uh, that was always fun to read. They, they could, you could read through those things. Uh, just kind of, I just enjoyed the characters and, it was a good bridge, like a lot of non-bridge stuff at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And hilarious. So well written, Victor Malo. So uh, you just got into the ACBL and then you started uh, going to tournaments. Uh, so uh, traveling the world, playing bridge everywhere. No, no, no. So Shuki, the my first bridge teacher was a woman named Shuki, and she was pretty eccentric French woman. And she could play with me once a month at the local bridge club. And so then she found this 
guy who was younger than me, who was a UVA student, and she started playing with him, and then I started playing with him. His name's Jason Holderness, and he was better than I was. And we then went, uh, Jason and I, when the D Nationals were in D.C. in like 2009, I think, Jason and I went up there and we played in like a two-session, 199er pair game that we won. And so we got little trophies from that, which unfortunately I threw away. I think I think I threw away the photo that they took too. <laughs> but I forget what your original question. Just like you know, when you started playing tournaments and you know traveling a bit more, uh, as, as opposed to just going to the so local, like uh, my local first club. national was in 2012. So I quit my job at Quantitative Investment Management, and I gave like they said, "Will you give us two weeks?" And so the last day of my two weeks was like that day, literally that day I left for Memphis to play in my first national. That was in spring of 2012. And there was a sectional the weekend before, and I hired this kid named Rob Brady, who was a UVA student, who was a, a pro, to be my partner. And I forget who our teammates were, but we won the Swiss. And that was my first time winning a sectional Swiss. and. Winning the Swiss made me a life master. Oh wow, that's a that was a good timing for everything. <laughs> pretty pretty fun, pretty fun. So uh, though, so then after that, you were just like hooked on nationals. Uh, I mean, because nationals are a pretty fun experience. Uh, I mean, if you haven't been to one, I think they're really fun things to go to. So yes, I mean, essentially yes. I, before I played my first national, I was in at a conference for work in February of 2012 and it was in Palm beach and Gavin Wolpert lives near there. And so I knew about Gavin from bridge winners and I messaged him on BBO and asked him if I could play with him. And so I played two days with him in the sectional and he said, which I think is a great piece of advice that I like to give out to people is play against the best competition that you can play against. And that's playing at the nationals. So uh, I've been fortunate to, I've gone to every national, but one since then. And I've also played in uh, one, two, played in four world championships now. Very good. Uh, where was your favorite place to play bridge? I think Tromso, Norway. I played in the European championships there and it's inside of the Arctic circle. So it's it was in the summer and literally the sun didn't go down um that was a pretty unique a unique experience so how is bridge over there like uh run differently than it is here like uh is because it feels like it you know we may be a little bit outdated in uh some of the technology available <laughs> is when you played like in the world championships, uh, overseas, how did it Well, prepare? I think the first time I played behind screens was at a bridge tournament in Bulgaria. And the top seven tables were behind screens and they had like plastic boards. And I remember the, the further that we got in down in the table ranking, we had never seen this before. We had like these leather, little leather sleeves that had the cards in them. But the European Championships and the World Championships, as I imagine you know, are like they're all screens. All the tables are screens. You're playing the same deals at the same time. Everybody's playing the same deals. It's uh, it's cool because there's a lot of people there that I that are new to me. So you know the national, the U.S. Nationals it tends to be tends to be a lot of the same people. But in Europe, it was like a whole new whole new crew of people more uh, uh foreigners come to america than americans go to the foreign countries it seems I mean, there's not very many americans that really do much traveling to play bridge over there as as far as, as over here it seems do you find it that way or do you know a lot of americans that are going all over these uh, you know the, the, the americans that are hiring real like good teams for the nationals tend to probably play over there, I would think. Like, there's a tournament. The European Open is this summer in Strasbourg, uh, which I think is in France. And the head of the EBL was telling me that he wants to get 200 teams in the Open, 
which would be amazing. I would really like to go for it, but I don't have firm plans yet for playing in that. Also, it feels like in Europe that the the main events are really the main events. Like the, the ACBL does a good job of making the events that are going on concurrent to the Soloway, like the board of match that we won. They make a good, they do a good job of making those like standalone. Whereas I feel like when you get knocked out in Europe of an event, it's it's not really a title and an event like that doesn't really carry the same magnitude of that it might in the ACBL. I see. So, uh, what kind of uh, systems do you like to play? Um, I like to play pretty basic, uh, two over one, natural bidding, not a lot of complexity. I don't have a like, I don't have a strong long term partnership with one individual. So, I've noticed over the years you do play with a lot of a lot of different uh, players, and I think that's a good thing. What do you feel like? You learn like a little bit of something from, you know, everybody you play with. I mean, one thing I'll say about bridge, I think I really like to play with people that I enjoy their company. And I feel like that we're a good, I feel like, like it's important for me to be able to discuss like th that my partner has the right mentality and that we can discuss the boards that we didn't do well and not get, not get angry with each other. So, uh, yeah, okay, we've been mentioning uh, the Mitchell Border Match, which you just recently yeah. won. There you were playing with a, a relatively new partnership? Yeah, I was playing with uh, Svenny Eriksson, who I met. I played the Icelandic, uh, the Reykjavik Bridge Festival a couple of years ago, and I met Svenny there. And he was playing with this guy named Niels, who's Danish. And the two of them were just pure comedy. Like Niels had tried to rent a car for the tournament and it had all gone haywire. And he had gone through all these, all this effort to get this car that eventually really just sat in a parking garage in Reykjavik. Like he didn't even use it after spending all this energy and time trying to get this car. And so that story, being told that story over the course of like the days of the event, really, I mean, we laughed so hard about it so much and so i really enjoyed him and then in austin uh the first nabc post covid he was there and i needed a partner for the swiss and so we got to talk in and we did pretty well in that and then we played the swiss again in providence and we did well in that and so we played the same teammates this uh, whole time? Uh, the teammates for the Swiss and Providence and, and for Phoenix were the same. Uh, Jovi, uh, Jovi Smetarova and Sasha Wernel. They're Austrian, a mixed pair. Jovi's a woman. And uh, so was that uh, everybody? everybody's first uh, yes. win there on, on yes. the team? That's pretty exciting for you all to experience it at the same time. So like, how, how long were you just on the moon? Uh, you know, probably like a good, good 10 days through the rest of the Yeah, for definitely. Sure. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. It, it's, I, I mean, I playing with Jovi and Sasha in a mixed border match in Providence, the summer national, we came in second and we were leading after every segment of the, of the event, but the last one. And that was the first time I'd ever come in second. And the first time I'd ever really even been close to winning in one of these events. And so we had a really good session in the, on the second day of the border match, the Mitchell's a two day event. And I had been in the position before and I really wanted to win this time. And then during the session, Svenny and I, we just didn't seem like it was going well. We got to probably the third from final round and we played against Curtis cheek and we got to Issa and Curtis's table and they're like, how's it going? And Svenny's like, no, we don't have a chance. <laughs> so, but Parker, I, I mean, Parker. yeah, I mean, we just did, but you know, Jovi and Sasha play this canapé system, strong club. So they, I don't know how we won, but we won comfortably. It, it was, it was like, uh, 
Yeah, when when the woman from the ACBL told told me that we had won, she goes, "John, you won," and I went, "Ah!" Like, like I had to cut myself off from really squealing, like I wanted to. I think a lot of people. What? Heard you what? Anyway. I think a lot of people did hear you. And anyway. that was that was like probably one half or one third of what I like. If I really had, yeah. I just remember seeing you that uh, day right afterwards and I uh, went over to say hello to you and you were just like beaming like, I mean, it was like, <laughs> I'm so happy. So you went from first national 2012 to winning national like 10 years later. Um, but it's somewhere in between there, you decided that you were going to produce a movie about Bridge called Double Dummy. So why? What happened there? So my first national event was the Imp Pairs in Memphis. And I played with a local guy from Charlottesville named Greg Humphreys, who I'm sure you know. And Greg, Greg. He has an Emmy, right? He has a he has an Academy Award. He has like an Academy Award, I think, for create for writing a book about motion graphics or something like that. So Memphis was my first national. I didn't know anybody. And he invited me to this brainstorming session on how do we get new players, uh, young people playing bridge. And I, I really didn't even know what the event was, but he said, there's a free dinner. There's going to be people there. And so I thought, I Got thought, him. okay, great. I, I need to meet some people. I want to make some friends. And free dinner sounds okay. I mean, maybe it won't be the best food, but whatever. And so that was, I had just quit my job. I did marketing for the hedge fund. So I knew, like, I knew how to sell things or what sold. And so that was kind of the, that was the free dinner. I see. So, but the no experience or anything, you just up and like, this is going to be brand new, like the whole movie industry uh, out of nowhere. Like, I mean, you didn't go to school for this and. You just, so I mean, it's, it's just a lot involved, I, I'm sure, in, in, make, in like finding the right people and making a movie. So it wasn't, it wasn't at that brainstorming session that I had the idea for the movie, but it was at that brainstorming session. I didn't have another job lined up. I just knew that I wanted to stop. I needed to stop doing what I was doing. And so I thought I could be involved in helping introduce Bridge to more young people. And then I came home and... Two of my friends were making a movie about a, a scripted film, and we they took me out to dinner, and they one of them said, "I think we're, you're the only person we know that plays bridge," and so I told him about some of the statistics from this brainstorming session, and he said, "That sounds like a documentary movie," and then that was that was where that that came from. And so you just began filming. It was it uh, just pretty much all all at one. Uh... Youth World Championships, right? Uh, most of it, or is there? There was a lot of uh, outside. So of I had I had met that. Adam Kaplan through Greg at the uh, at the NABC the spring one twenty twelve, and he really, I was really impressed with. In spite of him being twenty years younger than Greg, Greg's my age, and Adam was sixteen at the time, and uh, that the way he was making fun of Greg talking about how Greg thought about these bridge deals that we were playing, that we were, you know, talking about after the round. And I knew about Adam from bridge winners. And so he was already like kind of a star to me when I first met him. I'm like, Oh, that's Adam Kaplan. And so he became the focal point of the film. And he was, he was kind of the leader of a group that included the Grossacks and the Jang brothers and his partner, Zach Breskel, of like an under-21 team playing in the Junior World Championships that took place in, in August of, uh, of 2012. So, yeah, that's the focal point of the film. Where are these uh, world, world Championships? It was in, uh, in Taisong, China, which is about two hours from Shanghai. And this is a, like a really long tournament, right, with a big round-robin phase and everything similar to like the b Yeah, World there stuff? was... Uh, I think there were 17 teams in their in their division and you play all 16 other teams and then you have a full day knockout matches and the finals actually a day and a half. 
So it was 12 days, 12 days of filming that we were, 12 days of play. So you took a lot of this footage and you you made it made a movie of it and uh, you're trying to uh, attract some young people. That's uh, that's really nice. So uh, the Grossacks also in this uh, movie they've done really phenomenal since then as well. So they've uh, really had quite a lot of success together and and even uh, apart. And uh, particularly Zach Grossack uh, just recently cover the bulletin for winning a Player of the Year. Um, so what do you think about how that is going to impact the movie you know like because zach is in this movie and then now here he is proving himself again later you know i mean what do you think what are your thoughts on that so the movie's now freely available on pbs.org if you search for double dummy it'll come up you can watch it anywhere in the world it's not geo-blocked obviously as a filmmaker to have for the the kids team in the tournament itself the way that went down was really great for us. I don't want to spoil it for we anybody. Can't, we can't. Don't yeah, ruin I'm not, that. I'm not going to spoil it, but it was really a great it. event from the kid's standpoint. And then when I originally, Adam Kaplan was like, Zach has really turned into what I hoped Adam Kaplan would, would become. I didn't even know Zach before we got to China. And I was hoping that Adam Kaplan would be the next Jeff Maxtroth, really. And... Zach is really, I mean, you know, as you said, like he's player of the year. Like, you know, that's, I mean. It's such a young age. I mean, uh, just really is such a great accomplishment. Yeah. But it's hard. Like it, one of the things about this film is we sent an email out to everybody that is on like a board, like a, a unit board or a district board or that owns a club or is it a member of the APTA. And I probably got like 20 emails back from, you know, maybe, I don't know how, I don't even know how many emails that was that we sent out. So if like getting people to actually pay attention to the film is challenging and I'm really grateful that it's on PBS. So it's airing on specific PBS stations and you can find that on our website, doubledummymovie.com, but it's also freely available. I'm just glad that it's like, that we have this PBS distribution arm because, you know, having spent 11 years working on this project, I just want people to see it. I want, and it, it, it's beyond me at this point. And hopefully it'll be mean. It'll, there'll be a meaningful impact. You know, like uh, there was a post on bridge winners today by somebody talking about the Nebraska airtime. So it's, it's, but it's been frustrating, like doing this and not always feeling like people are taking, you know, taking the reins like of the film. So uh, I remember many years I would always come up to you go like, "How's the movie going? How's the movie going? <laughs> How's the movie going?" Like year after year, and then uh, to finally hear, and then to finally get to, I saw uh, you put you did uh, some kind of thing at the nationals. I think where we aired it in the. There was a group of people. I mean, I don't know, maybe. 50 to 100 people in Toronto. That was a longer it. version of the film. This is actually a shorter version. And if you ask my mother, she would say it's much better, which I agree with. A shorter yeah. version is better. Okay. I hadn't seen the new. I, mean, I just saw the one uh, at the at the time uh, where you put it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Toronto Nationals. I remember. So 11 years in the process and uh, podcast, podcast now. So sometime and now you're like, a movie wasn't enough. I'm going to also make a podcast. And is it is it is it the same type of a deal trying to draw a bridge into to the world, or expand the bridge or what? What's the reason for that? So the podcast? original reason rationale for the podcast was to spread the word about the movie. And then it just became fun. Like I, I enjoy the opportunity to have conversations like this. It's fun, it's challenging, it's a great way to share my passion for bridge. One consistent piece of feedback I've gotten, though, is from non-players that listen to the podcast, is they don't really know what we're talking about. Like, it's too high-level bridge. There's too many specific names of yes. people and, yes, like things that uh, we take yes. for granted. Like, we talk about a Vanderbilt yes. or whatever. And they're like, what's a Vanderbilt? Yes. You know, something like that. Yeah, I understand. And I've tried at so, points to to be more inclusive. And it's challenging. Like it's, it's definitely challenging. And I don't necessarily want to water it down. Like I, I enjoy 
the high level of it. And we definitely have our fans, you know, like I'm going to give a shout out to uh, one of your partners, Josh Dunn's dad, Cliff is a regular listener. Hope you don't fall off your mountain bike when you hear this reference. Uh, we actually started doing a segment because Josh told me that Cliff listens to all the shows. And then he, if Josh is ever mentioned, he'll send him a, a like thing from the transcript. And so we started doing a Cliff Don where somebody had the Cliff Don segment where somebody would tell a story about Josh. So my story about Josh, not that you asked, was at my first nationals playing in the Vanderbilt for the first time because Gavin suggested it. We it was a three way and we lost in the uh afternoon. So we were playing Josh Dunn's team in the evening. And it was I think Kit Woolsey was on the team, perhaps. I don't remember who Josh was playing with. I think Josh was playing with Roger Lee actually. And I remember thinking after the second segment that we won <laughs> and they beat us by like 40 in that segment. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know. <laughs> Funny. So anyway, uh, yeah, so you had a lot of, you ended up having a lot of, uh, you know, great people on, uh, on your, your podcast, uh, you know, great players, uh, like, you know, or even early on, you had like Jeff Maxtroth and some, well, who are your, some of your favorite, uh, episodes? Do you have standout episodes where it's just like, you know, why wow, this is like, you know, bridge on, a, on another level. Like I just getting to know somebody that's like, it's just like, I think the three people that come to mind are Gavin because it was the first one. And I'd been wanting to do the podcast for a long time, probably three years. And so when I actually recorded the conversation, I thought, wow, this is, you know, it was just cool to actually finally do it. And he tells a great story about ducking with King and one offside. And I mean, that was just why I wanted to do it. And then Hammond, you know, probably the most recognizable bridge name. And then Max Stroth, because he just was great. Like he told great stories and, you know, Jeff has really, uh, helped me become a like get more out of my bridge ability by challenging me to to be a better player and uh so jeff is always a very uh like fierce competitor i mean he's like yes i mean but he's always so friendly and helpful away from the game as well you know but uh he is uh, always at the table. It's like nothing. He doesn't miss anything. He's never phased. It's just like, how, how does this guy ever, never do anything wrong? <laughs> he was my partner for a regional last year in Hilton Head. And at first, it went from like being elated that I'm playing with Jeff Maxtroth to being so frustrated with him because he was frustrated with me. And it took me a while. Like I was driving back to Virginia after the second day we played together and I was listening to these podcasts and I thought, man, this, you know, eventually it got through to me that the reason that he was upset with me is I wasn't getting the best out of myself. And that led me to have my best year of bridge ever last year, which, uh, yeah, it was a really, really good year capping it off. <laughs> still, you still see you glowing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, some of your other favorite bridge memories. Well, I'll tell a story. So I played my first world championships in Sanya in 2014. And the way that I ended up doing that was Christina Lund Madsen had emailed me and she said that her and Dennis Bilda, who's one of the you know great players, great young players uh, in the world, they were looking for a partners for the mixed teams. And that sounded like fun. I really liked Christina. I didn't know much about her, her playing. Uh, but I knew Dennis was a really like a rising star. And so I needed to have a female partner. I said, I don't have a female partner. And she suggested Migri, uh, Migri Zer Campanile, who's, who's also been a guest on the show. And I remember when, <laughs> when Migri, so I went up and met her in New York city. We had lunch on her birthday and we hit it off and we're like, let's do this. And and then I remember when we talked on the phone, or we tried to talk on the phone for the first time, Migri is originally from, uh, well, she immigrated to Israel, but she's originally from Romania. And I remember I couldn't understand her. 
And I was like, I don't think this is going to work. So, uh, <laughs> are you speaking English? <laughs> Migri introduced me to a lot of her friends. And I think just that's one of the things about bridge is like, it's, it's kind of a strange dynamic because we're playing against the other people. So there are more often than not, you know, people are your opponent, but at the same time, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kinship and, you know, spirit and, uh, you know, like for example, you congratulating me in in Phoenix for winning the national for winning the event. Like so many people were so excited for for me, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's nice. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it, a lot of camaraderie. You know, it's it's bitter competition at the table, but then away from it, at the parties at night or whatever afterwards. You know, the drinking at the bars and going over the hands. And so, speaking of hands, that you're like. Most nightmare hand ever. Uh, well, there was a hand at the. I played in the mixed world championships this year with uh, Olivia Sherson as my partner, and we were playing in the pairs. We didn't make it to the uh, heads up matches for teams, and we're playing in the pairs. And I had like uh, ace six of diamonds, queen ten double ten of clubs. Jack fourth of hearts. So I had ace, queen, jack, six of diamonds, queen, 10, double 10, jack fourth of hearts. So they opened a, I was fourth and they opened a Polish club on my right and every, nobody's vulnerable. So I bid three diamonds and it goes, what happened? I forget what happened, but they got to seven. Eventually lefty bid six hearts. So Polish club, you don't get, it's like a strong club and that you don't reveal your suit at first. Or the fact that so you're I, I didn't have Jack fourth of hearts. I had, I had like 10, I think I had 10 fourth of hearts. Anyway, now, so now the guy bids five hearts, then lefty bids six hearts and then they bid seven hearts. And I'm kind of rooting for them to bid seven hearts. <laughs> So I lead the ace of diamonds because I'm thinking, you know, there's no way that they're bidding this grand slam with the king of diamonds. You know, they're not valuing that. But lo and behold, lefty had king fourth of diamonds. <laughs> so now Declare has a chance to make it. And I'm like, shit. I was rooting for that. And now I'm get, about to get burned. So dummy had ace third of clubs. And Declare had King, Jack, Nine, Fourth. And if they, so I'm like, am I going to play the Queen of Clubs on the first round of clubs? So he drew trumps and now he plays, I think I had three trumps. I don't know. I'm telling the story terribly. But he, on the first round of clubs, he plays club to the ace and I play the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> and now. Did he have like nine of them? And he's no, like, he play, no, no, it actually worked. He played, he played back and he thought, and he thought and I played the nine and I won the 10. And I was like, yeah. So it went from being a nightmare to like. It was all both your nightmare and your yeah. most favorite hand. All yeah. Like yeah. Nightmare hands. I mean, so many nightmare hands. I remember a hand Migri in the world championships, we were on the verge of qualifying for the finals of the world pairs in 2014, my first world championship, the world bridge series. And there was a hand where I had like uh king and one spade and we had a two over one auction and then she bid two no. And now I just bid three no. Cause you know, that was just the right thing to do. And they lead a spade through my king and it goes queen and then, declare, and then my lefty plays the ace of spades and Migri's Jack Doubleton comes. And now they've got the whole spade suit. And I'm like, God damn it, Migri, why are you hogging the hand? Uh, <laughs> funny, funny. So, uh, most important bridge convention, if you can only have one. Oh, wow. Probably negative double, I think. Uh... I played in London. You used to talk about the Bridge and the Menagerie series. I played Rubber Bridge for the first time over there, and I felt like I was a character. I felt like I was in that book when I was playing. Oh, which one were well, you? Well, I wasn't. I just felt like 
I didn't have a character myself, but I just felt like I was like playing with the characters in that book. And we, they don't let you play negative doubles there. They don't let you play. Don't they all play like usually the same? Everybody yes. plays the same thing. Like that. The, 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 they don't. Play. You play. They don't you let play. you play Roman key card. You can only. You can't find out about the King of Trump or the Queen of Queen of Trump. Bobby uh, Wolf was a big uh, advocator of uh, not playing key card. He wouldn't mind being on uh, in a slam on the finesse of the King of Trumps. So he would always know. Although you may know you're off a key card, he would know that it was the king because <laughs> <laughs> he would know about the number of aces because he didn't count the king as a key card. He counted mm-hmm. that later in the kings or whatever. So so he would know that he would be on mm-hmm. a finesse. He wouldn't mind it. Is it better than like being there and like, oh, am I off the ace? <laughs> it's not even on a finesse. It's <laughs> off the ace. You <laughs> lose the ace. <laughs> Is he someone that's been a mentor to you? Like I know he's from Texas. I think I got to play with Bobby one time, and uh, I just remember that was like, we 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 wrote down like four things on the convention. Card. We had those uh, the white commit the old fashioned white convention cards. I think we wrote down like four things, like fifteen, seventeen, real big with transfers, <laughs> or something, and then and we wrote down you know ace asking. It was like not. It was not. And we and we wrote down carding or something, and uh, so we we played. Uh, we played that one time, and uh, I played as a teammate of his uh, a few times. He had some uh, of his regular older partners uh, that he played with some some long ago, and and I played against him many times from uh, the area that I was playing in. Uh, so I think he eventually moved to Vegas, and uh, I don't know what's happened. I don't even know. I, I'm sure I've played against him, but not. Uh... I only have a couple okay. more questions. By the way, I just Who's I want to say. You? That Greg sent me a full list of questions, including like the best hand. I, I don't know if the best hand was in there, but I wanted to be spontaneous. It would have been something like the best hand would have been good to think, or worst hand would have been good to think about before. Uh, but you did send me like a yeah, full that, list. That one, I, I'm not even sure I included questions. that. I did throw, I, I did have some questions that weren't on your list that I asked you. So anyway, like this one Who's faster, you or Justin Law? Were you at that tournament? No, but I heard about it. So you're referring to at the Williamsburg Regional some years ago, we had a a race in the hotel conference area, and it was probably a 50-yard dash, and Justin smoked me. (laughs) Sad but true. I I don't have anything else, John. I'm going through my list of questions. How, what do you? What is your setup there? Do you have like a sheet of paper with all the questions on them? Do you have them like? Uh... Yeah, I, I, I'm looking at my little questions here. Yeah, and then some of them, you know, I had to skip over because you kind of covered them mm-hmm. already. You know, they were going to be questions, but that's okay. I mean, it's great. You know, it's great. I don't have to ask questions. You just knew what I was going to ask you. Well, as if you knew, like so, so, so somebody maybe fed you the questions. No, Boy. you did, but I mean, I really appreciate it. When I saw that list of questions, I wasn't sure if you were. Like how committed you were to it, and if if it was more like me saying, "Oh, you know, you offered to do this, but maybe." Anyway, when I got that list of questions from you, I was really it really touched me, like that you were uh, that you were thinking about it so much. Well, I'm glad. I mean, this went. I I was a little nervous about how this may go because it's you know not so easy to just to be you know talking, and you're you're used to it. I'm I'm not I'm not so used to it. <laughs> it's funny how it's be- funny how it's something that is so natural just to do like me and you for me and you to talk. But then when it becomes a, yeah, that's what made it easy for me. Cause I mean, you know, we're looking at each other on the camera or whatever, so we can see each other. And it's just like, to me, it's not like really doing an interview at all. I mean, you know, it's more like just talking to mm-hmm. a friend, you know, just like tell me more about you. you know, tell me something I didn't know. Mm-hmm. What was the most surprise? Like, what was the depth? What was the depth? Can you give, is there a way for you to explain the depths of the research that you did? For, like, what, the, the what, what do you think was like the most down a rabbit hole you went? I didn't go that far, really. I was like, uh, you know, I, I, I just, yeah, I found your police profiles and <laughs> your mugshot. That, that, was, that was the most surprising to me is when I found your mugshot. I have never been arrested, by the way. For all my loyal listeners out there, I, I have not. 
Well, they should take that off the internet then. <laughs> um, well, thank you. No, I, I, I seriously, I, I didn't, I didn't do that much research. Um, and you know, I mean, just, I, I, I know a lot about mm -hmm. you already. <laughs> You're a great guy. And, and, and a lot of people, a lot of people know a lot about you. Well, it's, 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 I'm flattered and I really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. And, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me once more. I really enjoyed it. And we'll see you again on the circuit. Are you playing any tournaments? Before? Next nationals. I don't know. So who's your, who's your team going to be in the next national? I've got some know. possibilities out there, but nothing is confirmed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in, the intrigue. We'll see you there in New Orleans. We're going though for oh, yeah, sure, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I'm definitely playing. You playing with Vinny or? I don't think so. You don't know. They need, nothing's confirmed. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. I'll see you in New Orleans. I'm, I'm actually playing in the yeah. North American Paris. Are you going to be there for that? No, no. I'm... Have you won that? Platinum Paris. No, I've, I've, I think I only entered one time. To the national level, we made it and we got knocked out first day or something. What was your first national yeah, I've win? I've never done well in that event. My first national win was in New Orleans, where we're going now. And in 2004, we won the North American Swiss. But that was in the fall of 2004. This is spring of 2020. Whatever. Had you been close before then? I was fourth in the LMs once uh, before that, the three day LM Paris. We, like basically lost in the last round. Mm. <laughs> it was mm. pretty close. Who was your partner? A uh, guy with a uh, I, I don't play with him. I haven't played with him in a long time. But Nagy mm. Nagy came out from. Uh, he's from Texas also. He's one of my original players that I mm. used to play with. Learning back in the day, played a lot of bridge with him, but not not so much in the last fifteen years. If you could, if you could teach bridge to one person on the planet, who would it be? To teach to yeah. one person, like on you the got planet? to choose your bridge student. Who would it be? Yeah, it would be like, yeah, he's my yeah. So like somebody famous, like uh, I don't know, maybe uh, yeah, I don't know. That's too tough of a question. Some like famous actor or something that would be pretty cool. All right, well, you got to give me an answer in New Orleans. Okay, I'll give you an answer in New Orleans. I'm... You put me on the spot now. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks. Thank you.